Bible with you, if you turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings is where we have our message from today, and that's our topic. As you're turning there, I'd just like to thank the pastor for the opportunity to bring the Bible message. And I hope that you came not to hear my words, but to hear God, because if you came to hear mine, then you're not going to really hear much at all. And that's the truth. Amen. So if you found your place here in 2 Kings, chapter 6, we see a story taking place. We see Samaria, the city, is going through a famine. A really great famine, where people are starving to death, and they're having to do horrible things just to get food. And we'll look in just a moment, we'll read verse 24. But this text, and all the books around this book of 2 Kings, are like spiritual gold mines. And if you read them and read the stories, you'll see that there's lessons that you can learn that can apply to your life specifically. And they can enrich your life and enhance your Christian life. And so this is just one of those powerful stories. And we see there's a siege on the city of Samaria. Samaria and I'll read verse 24. If you follow along, the Bible says, And it came to pass after this that Ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cat of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So we see that the king of Syria was planning an attack on the city of Samaria. And his, his plan, his method of attacking the city was to sit outside of the city and to cut off their supplies so they couldn't have any food or resources coming into the city. And it's a very merciless strategy because you're starving the enemy to death. And so this king of Syria is camped outside of the city and he's waiting for the people to starve to death or for the defenses to get weak enough to where he can go in and to capture and take, take over the city of uh, Samaria. And if you just look down a little bit to chapter number 7, when we're reading verse 1, the Bible says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel. In the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not be thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? And that's our text for tonight. And it's the title of the message. Why sit we here until we die? When we look at our nation and the world that we live in, it's no doubt getting worse and worse. The forces of evil are progressing more and more each day right in front of us. And the Bible clearly tells us that it's going to get worse because it says that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And so if we just take a look around us at our nation, even our own sin, even our own city, just getting worse and worse. I mean, each year, worse and worse. More things, more excuses for them to do things that are against God's law. Yes. And it makes me think when I think about this. Where are the people opposing them? Where are the people? I mean, whose job is it to fight the evil? Whose job is it to be the ones that stand in place and stop them from advancing with their agenda? Because no doubt they have an agenda. And no doubt they believe in their agenda because they're doing everything that they can to get their message across. Yes. If you just look at the parades that they're having, look at the, the things that they're doing, the, the actions that are taking place. And by the way, no one is telling them to do it. They just believe it so much that they willing, they willingly choose to do it and give all their efforts to it. And so my question is, why isn't somebody doing something? Why is people just sitting around looking at it? People that realize that it's bad and just saying, well, I hope someone comes along and does something. Mm -hmm. And 
And so this message is specifically for what's going on in this nation and about people doing something about it. Because if it's not us, then it's going to be nobody. Because we have the truth. Out of all the religions in the entire world, out of all the religions, you have heard the truth. Amen. I have the truth. Amen. We are serving the one true and living God. Yes. We should be the ones that are giving all of our efforts in combating everything that the devil wants to do. But oftentimes we find ourselves just sitting back and sitting around waiting for someone else to do something. Whether it be because we don't think that we're a leader. Maybe you don't think you're a leader. Maybe you don't think that you're a good speaker or you don't have many talents or abilities. But if you look at the stories in the Bible, you see who God chooses to make his work. I mean, look at Moses. The man Moses, the one that God chose to lead his people out of captivity in the land of Egypt. The one that he chose to lead his people across dry ground over a sea. I mean, Moses had no time. In fact, he actually had something against him. He had a speech of him. He couldn't speak that well. Yet he was able to stand in front of the king of Egypt, the most powerful army, the king of the most powerful army in the entire world at the time. And he's able to stand before him and tell him to let his people go. Yes. You see, God doesn't do his work in this world through people with special talents or abilities. He just does work through people who are willing, who are obedient. Yes. So we come to, to this text tonight, and we see that these men had three choices. And that's what I want to focus on tonight, is those three choices. And so, if you look with me in, verse, in chapter 7, I'll read verse 3 one more time. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Verse 4, If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Amen. So these four men, they're not really in a good position. I mean, they don't have many choices. And none of them look too promising. And we see this first choice here. And they say, if we say, we will enter the city. So the first choice is to enter the city. And so they're thinking about their choices. They think about this first choice that they have. And they say, well, what does the city have to offer? And so if you look at it, I mean, it's going through a famine. There's not really much they could, they could offer these men. And not only is the city going through a famine, but these men have a disease called leprosy. And so what that is at that time was they didn't have a cure for it. And so the people that got leprosy, since it was very contagious, they weren't allowed to be around the normal civilization. And so they were outcasts. So nobody wanted to be around them. And so as they're, they're thinking about this first choice about entering the city, they decided that if they go into the city, they're going to starve. And they wouldn't be accepted there even if there wasn't a <coughs> because they are lepers. And so this first choice is not really uh, too appealing to them because the city was just a place for them just to go to die. There was not even a single glimmer of hope for them. And not only that, but this city is a picture of the world today. And if you look at the city, I'll, I'll read verse 24 and a few verses down where it says, of chapter 6, And it came to pass after this that ben the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and a fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. I mean, the state of this city, like, it's an incredible famine. I mean, people were literally paying for doves dump. Think about that. They're paying pieces of silver for doves dump just so they can get their hands on anything that's edible. We'll continue reading here at verse 26. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, the king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, 
Listen to what this says. This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. I mean, the, the place that the city is in, the state that the city is in, is in such... It's, it's really a horrible situation for everybody involved in the city. I mean, the story of the woman is really, it's really, it's scary to think about. But this city is a picture of the world today because to those lepers men, the city had nothing to offer them. And to us, the world has nothing to offer us. There is nothing in this world that we can obtain that's going to matter. It's not going to amount to anything. The Bible actually says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, if you'd like to write this down, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All the universities, all the institutions, all the people giving their lives to teach people something, for all the people that have given their lives to build great statues, great religious shrines, all the people that have put all these efforts to do something, it's not going to amount to anything. It's not going to matter. This world and this city have nothing to offer, has nothing to offer us and had nothing to offer these men. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the Bible says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. The world has nothing to offer us. There is nothing that is going to last in this world. The only thing that this world offers is temporal things. Something that's going to satisfy you for just a little while. Something that's going to make your life a little bit better before you die. There's nothing that's really going to do anything that's going to amount to you for eternity. The only thing that can give life is Jesus. The only thing that can give life is God. And so I want to notice what the king, I want you to notice what the king says to this woman in this in this instance of the woman and the king talking, the king recognized that he could do nothing for this lady. I mean, he says, and the king said to her, and he said, if the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? And so the king noticed he, he couldn't give anything for her. The world has nothing to offer us. And so the world does not give life. All it does is just prolong his death. And many people don't even realize this. They're so blinded. And so we see that even the, even the king of the, of the entire city recognizes that there's nothing he can offer her. There's nothing he can do. I mean, the king. Imagine, we had a king of America. Think about it. And we're going through a hard time in America. And you talk to the king. And he says, there's nothing I can do to help you. There's nothing. Imagine that. It's a, it's a horrible thing. But it's a picture of the world. And the world cannot offer us anything. And if you come seeking for life, the only place you can find it is God. If you go to the world, you're going to find nothing but death. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I am come that they might have life, and, they, and that they may have it more abundantly. And so the only place you can find life, the only place that you can find anything of substance, anything of real value, like real value, the only place you can find it is through Jesus. Literally the only place. And we are fortunate enough, you're fortunate enough to be in a place where you can have the truth and know the truth that you can find life through Jesus. But it's not enough to just know. It isn't enough to just know. It's more than that. You have to actually accept it and apply it and live it out and actually put faith behind it. Because the Bible says that faith without works is dead. If you, have, if you say you believe in something, but don't do it, you don't really believe in it. I mean, if I were to tell you that I believe that this chair is stable, but I say, oh, I'm not going to sit in it. You know, I'm not, I, I believe it's going to hold me, but I, I'm not going to actually do it. You wouldn't think that I believe the chair will hold me up. Because faith without works is dead. And so we have to have faith and actually have works behind our faith. And so the first choice they had is not much of a choice at all. Means to go into the city and to die. Hmm. And so look at the second choice. If you look at verse 3 in chapter 7. And there were four lepers men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here 
and still we die. If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, that's the second choice. To sit still there. I mean, they thought about the first choice to go into the city, and they realized they're going to die. Now here's the second choice. We can sit here. So they're thinking about the second choice. Well, this choice is not much of a choice at all. Because if they sat there, they're going to starve to death, or disease is going to kill them. Because they had no means of sustaining life for themselves. I mean, they're sitting on the outskirts of, of the gate. And they're outcasts from society. They have absolutely nothing to their name. It would just be a simply a matter of time before they die. Either on their own or by their starvation. And so this choice is really not much of a choice at all, but they decided, why sit we here until we die? They realized sitting here isn't going to do anything. And you know, a lot of people don't recognize this. They don't see this. They don't see that sitting there is going to do nothing. A lot of Christians don't even realize this. Like, you think that, oh, you're just going to sit there, or I'm just going to sit here and wait for somebody else to rise up, or wait for somebody else to put in the work, and to go out, and to do what God has commanded them to do. And, by the way, the only reason this church is here, I mean, the only reason that a year ago we started in a tent, waking up at 5.30 in the morning, leaving at 6, over to the Green Hill Lawn, and setting up this tent with just a handful of people, the only reason that we bought a bus for over $50,000 and the only reason that we spent all this money, the only reason for everything that this church has been founded for, is to share this with other people. Yeah. It's to not sit yeah. here. Yeah. It's to yeah. not sit here until we die. Yeah. That's the whole reason we're here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lord. If you can't yeah. recognize that, then you need to read the Bible. Yeah. Because that's what we're here for. Yeah. It's what the church is here for. The exact definition of a church. I'll tell you the definition of a church. Are you ready? Yeah. Don't miss it. This is the definition. It is a group of baptized believers voluntarily joining together, assembling together to carry out the Great Commission. Yeah. Yeah. That is the definition of a church. Yeah. It's to carry out the Great Commission. Yeah. So this message really is the entire Christian life. It really is. It's about not sitting here waiting for someone else to do something, but for you actually deciding that you're going to be the one to do something. For me actually deciding that I'm going to do something. Because we have the greatest thing that can ever happen to anyone. We literally have the greatest gift. Think about it. You have the greatest gift that anybody could ever get. Anybody. Anybody in the world. You have the greatest thing. It has happened to you if you're saved. It's happened to you. You have the truth. And you see the other side. You see how enthusiastic they are for the false ideology. So why are we so unenthusiastic for the truth? You know, this message should motivate you. Yeah. It should motivate me yeah. to do something, to actually do something. Yeah. So many people today don't even realize that they're lost and that they're headed to hell for all of eternity. And many people today are going to choose to sit still. Many people, many Christians, many Christians, not just the entire world, many Christians, a few Christians, many of them are going to choose to just sit still and to not actually do something. And so these people, this, these men, they realize that it's certain death if they sit there. And they realize that they can't sit there. They don't have a choice. They can't sit there. When are we going to realize that we can't sit here and do nothing? When is somebody going to choose to do something? Many people, they don't realize that sitting still is certain death. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 18, it gives us a description of our lost condition, of the people that are lost and don't have Jesus. It gives us a description. It tells us, John chapter 3, verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, yes. because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. One of the greatest needs today is for people to realize that they're not condemned for their actions, they're not condemned for their lies that they told, but it's for what they are. Right. It's for the sin that's born in them. Because a lot of people think that they're going to make it to heaven by doing something good. I mean, there's many religions founded on saying this, and that the whole thing is if you do good, if you do enough good, you'll get to heaven. And the Bible very, very clearly teaches that this is not true. And that is 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so a lot of people don't even realize that it's not their actions that condemn them, but it's just the nature of their very being that condemns them. Because it very clearly tells us that one man, by one man sin entered into the world. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so a lot of people think that they'll have enough time to make a decision. You know, they think, even Christians think, oh, I have enough time, or when this happens, I'll choose to not sit still. Or when this goes well, I'll choose to do something about it. Or when this lines up perfectly, then I'll, you know, I'll decide to go out and to tell people. So you want to know something? If you don't decide now, you're never going to decide. That's right. And if you don't believe me, you can try. <laughs> and you'll find out that you won't decide. If you don't decide now. And that's the truth. I remember talking to one of my friends about the gospel and things like that. And this is what he says to me. He said, if that's true, then before I die, I'll accept Jesus. That's what he said. If that's true, I'll just accept Jesus right before I die, so I get to heaven. But you know, that means you don't have faith in him. Because if you believe in him, then you will choose to live with him now. You will choose to do something about it now. Because if you're going to wait till your very last moment, that means that you want to live for yourself. You are living your life. You know, there's a lot of things worse than death. Death isn't the worst thing that can happen. There's a lot of things worse than death. And one of them, is living your life directly against God's law. And a lot of people think that they're going to live their life in a way that they think is best, in a way that satisfies them the most, and at the very end of their life, then they'll decide to give their life to Jesus. But the truth is, if you don't decide now, then it's never going to happen. You won't accept Him. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. This life is not something that we're promised. The Bible does tell us that if you're a Christian, that you will give you an expected end. But we don't know how long we have on this earth. And that should motivate us not to be scared, but to be motivated to live each day in according to God's will. So right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For me saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in, and, in, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you don't choose it now, then you're never going to choose it. If you don't choose to do something about it now, you're never going to choose it. And so this second choice, not much of a choice at all. I mean, they're, they're, they, they've already gone through two. There's only three. They've gone, they've gone through two, and both of them are certain death. And they're hoping that this third choice is hopefully at least a little bit better. And so if you look at the third choice with me, chapter 7, verse 4, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore, come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So that's the third choice. And this one isn't much of a choice at all. Because you see, the king of Syria, he's merciless. I mean, he's his attack on the faith is to starve the people until they die. And these people, the third choice that they choose is to go to these people and to just fall at their feet in hope, in hope that they let them live. That's the decision that they make. Because you know why they made that decision? Because they had a question. Why sit we here until we die? They decided that they're not going to go into the city because they're going to die. 
They decided that they're not going to sit there and do nothing until they die. They decided that they're going to do something. They're going to take their only hope and actually do something. And that's to go into these people. These people, the Syrian army. And so we see that Syria is at war with Israel. And that the Syrians wanted to destroy the Israelites. And so they laid this siege upon this city of Samaria. And to cut off the supply. It doesn't sound like a group that's going to be very friendly if you're a part of the people who are attacked. And so they have this one thing, and that's just to go and plead for mercy to an enemy that wants to destroy you. And so this is their attitude. If they save us alive, we shall live. But if they kill us, we shall but die. And so they realize that this is their only hope. They're not going to sit around and do nothing. They're not going to just sit around and let themselves just decay and, and lose to a disease, disease or lose to a famine. They're actually going to do something. And what happens because of this choice is a great miracle, a tremendous miracle. And you know, the people that aren't saved, this is their choice. They can choose to sit there and die. But they can choose to fall at the feet of their enemy. And the people that are lost, their enemy is God. But God doesn't want to destroy them. God wants to bring them to Him. Yes. And so this is the condition of people that are lost. This is the choice that they have to make is to, to sit still and, and, and die or to fall at the hands of your enemy. And you know what a lot of people today, you know what a lot of their problem is? It's pride. They don't want someone to be above them giving them orders and someone they have to listen to because they think that they can be in charge of their own lives. But we are so small compared to this universe that God has created. I remember back in Bible college, and I've said this before, but I was in Bible college last year, and I was taking a class called Bible Doctrine. And the teacher, is his name is Tim Tomlinson. And he's taught me so many things. I mean, just a, a, a crazy amount of things. And one of the things that we were talking about was how big God is. Like how big he is. And he said that the entire universe, the entire universe, this is how big God is. The entire universe, the size of that to God is like the size of his thumbnail. I mean, that, that's, that's how big God is. Think about it. But people don't realize how we are so small and God is so big that we don't matter. It's not about us. It's not about our pride or us ruling our own lives. It's about serving the one true and living God because at the end of your life, what you chose to do with God, that's going to be the decision that's settled. You can't change the decision. Now is the time that you make the decision whether to serve God or to be an enemy for God. The Bible says... John chapter 6, verse 37. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So God's desire is not to destroy, but it's to bring to him. It's to deliver. The Lord's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. When we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. And so we see this last choice, the third choice, was for them to go to the hand of their enemy. And it's not really much of a choice at all. But I want to continue reading, because I want to find out what happens, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the third choice, so let's see what happens. And they rose up, verse 5, and they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord hath made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, and hear, noise, uh, hear a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said unto another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, and left their tents, and their horses, and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled.
fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the... Actually, I'll stop right there. And so we see here, the Syrians, this is what they did. They thought that they heard a great army coming to them, to their camps. And so this is what they did. Mind you, this is just four lepers men coming to give their life to the Syrian army. But this is what the Syrians thought. They thought it was a great army coming to attack them. And so what they did was they left everything behind in the rain. Literally everything. We'll continue reading. And when these lepers, verse 8, when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and then eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Now, they come to this camp and it turns out that they literally left everything. They left silver. They left raiment. They left food. And these four leprous men were just coming out of their only hope to give their lives in hopes that they would keep them alive, but God had delivered them. Amen. Because, you know why I did it? You know why I did it? Because they chose to do something. They chose to sit around and just sit there until they died. They chose to actually put works behind their faith. Amen. And God blessed them for it. Amen. But the story doesn't end. It doesn't end. Let's continue to read Verse 9. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, have been blessed by God so much, and they haven't even shared it. They haven't even shared the message of the gospel to other people. Not even the blessings from God, but the message that God has given them. A lot of Christians don't share this message with people. And so these people are, are thinking about it right now. It says, if we tarry to the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. They realize that it was wrong to keep quiet about it. They recognized this. And so they went and they told other people about the good news. And you know, we have been so blessed by God. We have been, God has been so good to us. So good to us. I mean, you can't even describe how God has been, how good God has been to us. Even in America, we can come here and not worry about cops coming in and arresting us. You don't have to worry about it. And oftentimes we take it for granted. And oftentimes, a lot of times, we don't even share the gospel with other people. We don't share what Christ has done in our lives. Did you know, when we just sang this hymn just a few minutes ago, the agony that Jesus was in before he had to go and die. I mean, the agony, the torment that he was in. I mean, just, just think about it. He was in the garden. And he's praying. And he's sweating blood because of how much agony he's in. This is what he says. And he's praying to God. He says, Lord, if it be any other way, if there's any other way, literally any other way, because he's in so much agony, if there's any other way to make these people that I love so much be able to be reconciled back to yourself, if there's any other way, please just Choose that way. And you know what he said? There's no other way. There's no other way. Amen. And he still chose to die for every single one of us. Have you ever been going through something hard and there's something or someone that you choose to think about to help you get through that hard thing? Well, Jesus had to go through something hard. He had to go through crucifixion. He had to be crucified. He had to be tortured. And you want to know what he thought about that kept him going? He thought about me. He thought about you. Yes. And about how much he loved us. And that's what kept him going. Yeah. 
Because at any moment, at any moment, he could have literally just floated off. He could have done anything and just got off and stopped the torment. He literally chose to allow them to crucify him, to torture him, because of how much he loved us. And the thing that kept him going was me and you, knowing that we were enemies of him, but he still loved us. And so my question is, why doesn't somebody do something? With all this information, it doesn't do anything to just keep it in our head. It doesn't do anything to even keep it in our hearts. But it does something if you choose to do something about it. Because we know the enemy is advancing. And they're advancing worse and worse. They're giving more efforts each day. Each day they're thinking of more creative ways to get their message across to everybody. Each day that they're recruiting more people to share this message with other people. But what are we doing? I mean, yeah, we're meeting, but what are we doing after the meeting? What are we doing during the weeks when there's not a meeting? Are we sharing? Are we doing something about it? I mean, are we actually doing something about it? Because if it's not us, it's nobody. If we don't rise up, nobody's going to rise up. It's not going to be some miracle that God's going to raise up somebody else. That's not what it is. It's going to be God choosing to work you, through you by your obedience and by your action of wanting to actually do something. And that's the only two requirements that the Lord has. It's just to be willing and to be obedient. That's all it takes. That's all a Christian life is, is willingness and obedience. We'll pray and we'll close our eyes if you will with me and bow your heads. Just have a couple of questions. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to answer them. But just answer them in your heart. 